If you've got a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 2. That's where we're going to land for the morning. And um, if, you got it, if you don't have a Bible, it's going to be on the screen so you can follow along just fine. But I want to think about today the idea of our response, how we should respond to Jesus and his work and his birth. Like what, what should be our response to Jesus? Now, our, our neighborhood has shifted in the last couple of years. When we, when we bought our house almost 13, or over 13 years ago now, um, our neighborhood was mostly older kids, high schoolers, or college. Like, it was quiet. But um, as those families have sold, younger families have moved in, and our neighborhood has become very, very young family, very middle school. Like, we just have a lot of kids in our neighborhood now roaming. And, uh, and for, for lots of reasons, our house and our neighbor's house have become the hub for a majority of this little neighborhood gang that lingers around our neighborhood. Two, two reasons are my neighbors have a basketball hoop and we have a trampoline. And so we are the party place. And so from about 2.30 till 5, uh, not, not 2.30, 3.30 to about 5.30 when it's too dark to send these, when these kids need to go home, there is just noise and squealing and dribbling and, and scream, like all kinds of play noises from, from kids as young as five to as old as like 13, 14 year old middle schoolers out there bouncing around, dribbling around, having fun in our backyards. They all just kind of do some stuff together. So it is not a quiet work afternoon at the Gifford house. And what's interesting is as a parent, and you notice this, that parents have a unique gift. You can tell the different kinds of screams. Like you can tell screaming playing and screaming hurt. It's like this weird, this weird gift that parents can have. And not only can you tell the difference between one cry, like an emergency cry and a play cry, you can tell the difference between like your neighbor's kid's cry and your kid cry. Like there's just this, this gift to be able to tell the difference. So the majority of the time, when there's crying and yelling and screaming in my backyard, man, I'm sipping coffee on the couch, no big deal, right? It's just, this is just normal. I'm working, I'm drinking my coffee, life is good. I'm not getting up for that. But then every once in a while, there's the kind of noise that comes out that like makes you throw your coffee down and run out because some kid has done something on the trampoline, something's happened. You get the idea, right? There are certain times you can just kind of shrug it off and go, kids are playing. And other times you got to act. Other times you got to jump up and be the parent and interact. And that's in some ways how I think we treat Jesus. Many of us, maybe, maybe you've heard the news of Jesus and you kind of have that shrug off mentality, right? No big deal. Not really important for my life. I'm not putting my coffee down. Like, let's just keep going. I'm glad. I'm glad Jesus is here. I'm glad he came. I like his birthday. Christmas is awesome. Presents are great. Ham's cool. Like, we love our Christmas dinner. Like, there's kind of that shrug off. No big deal. I don't really need to act on this kind of response. But in reality, the news of Jesus requires it's the put down the coffee and run outside kind of response. It's the other kind of response where we don't just shrug it off. We don't just write it off, but we actively respond to the good news and the hope and the message of Jesus Christ. It is not a shoulder shrug response. It is an active response as we learn about Jesus is. And so today what I want to do is I want to look at Matthew chapter 2 and just walk through actually the story of the wise men. Because as we walk through this story, what we do is we learn kind of how we today, like the wise men and like others in the story, can respond both positively and negatively to Jesus. And I want to filter through and say, are we responding the right way to Jesus and his good news? Are we responding the way that God desires us and the way we need to respond to Jesus? So we're going to look at this passage and the big question is, how do we simply respond to Jesus. So I got four ideas I want to walk you through. Maybe that's something you struggled with or something you need to lean into as you respond to Jesus. But let's, let's not come to this Christmas morning with a shoulder shrug to Jesus. No big deal. Let's get up. Let's respond. Let's worship. Let's seek him. Let's respond rightly and actively to Jesus. So let's pray. And then I want to walk through this passage here together. God, we thank you so much for this morning. God, give us ears to hear give us eyes to see, and give our hearts a softness to listen to your word and to change according to your word. 
Every single one of us, as we hear of Jesus, maybe for the first time today, or maybe for many times throughout our life, we need to respond. Not with a shoulder shrug, not with a nice thought, not with a, oh, that's just this thing, but, but deeply in our hearts, changing ourselves, coming to him, repenting from our sins, believing in him, and having our lives shaped by Jesus Christ. So give us the heart to respond rightly as we see in this passage, not the wrong ways as we also see. God, help us to be convicted and to change and to see Jesus in his glory and his beauty and his greatness and help our lives to be shaped by him. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So how do we respond to Jesus? Here's the first thing. We respond to Jesus by seeking after him. I mean, that, that's the core of this story is that, that we see that we should respond to the message, the news, the idea, the person of Jesus by actively exploring, looking, finding him. Like we want to desire to know and explore and we want to know more about Jesus. That's exactly what we see here in the wise men. We see see wise men, not not even from Israel, not even Jewish, who see a sign of Jesus's birth and traverse great distances to seek and discover more about who Jesus is and what this means. And so look at verse 1 as we jump jump into our passage. It says this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is it who has been born the King of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising, and we have come to worship him. Now, this all takes place after Jesus' birth. So, like, in, if you want to compare things, Luke chapter 2, Luke's gospel, he, um, he deals really with Mary's perspective. A lot more details on the birth. Like, that's typical, right? A lot more details on the birth, a lot more situations of the birth itself. Matthew deals with uh, Joseph's story, so you just kind of skip over that part. You know, he, Joseph is communicating with a, in a dream that, that Mary's going to be pregnant. This is God's work. Marry her and, uh, and start your family. And then, then, then Joseph does that. And then we get to chapter two. After Jesus was born, this is where we're at now. So Jesus has been born. It might be a year, maybe a little over a year since he's been born. But the wise men are so critical to the Christmas story. And, and as you think about wise men, don't think about guys with big, long beards with a little bit of gray, just like me. Like think about, you know, you, when you think about wise men, you kind of think of like sage sort of older Yodas, Miyagi, Mr. Miyagi. Like, you think about the, the wise people just dispensing proverbs on people. The actual word for wise men is magi, which was a unique professional position. It was a job. And these people's jobs were to look for signs in the world, in the stars, in whatever, like it, all sorts of crazy things, honestly. They would try to figure out the future or significance of things and advise others based on what they see. And so they were kind of like advisors to the kings and they had specializations. Some specialized in this and that. Daniel, as we look at the book of Daniel, he was kind of a, he was a wise man at some level, like not, not, not in this sense, but, but they advised the king on what to do, the rulers and what to do. And so these wise men are professional astrologers, kind of scholars, and they, their, their job was to look at the sky for things that might have significance that could help shape and lead the kingdom. And so these guys, they got a lot wrong historically, but they look at the sky and they go, whoa, something, something new is going on here. We don't know a whole lot of details about what they saw, but in verse two, it says, we saw his star at its rising and we've come to worship him. Where's the king of the Jews? We saw his star. We saw this sign and we've come to worship him. We don't know what the star is. Like, I don't want to overly guess. Some people have said this star was a special comet. Some people have said this star is a unique planetary alignment. Some have said this star is just God himself in his glory shining down. Um, The truth is we don't know. We don't overly need to guess. And the other thing that's important is the star is not really all that important. The star's job was to point out Jesus, not to be the star of the show. And the funny thing is, when my kids were little, um, Kaylin and Jackson particularly, when they were little, we had a, um, 
We had this, we had, I don't know if we, we might still have it in the closet someplace, like a Fisher Price nativity set. Kids, you ever seen that? Like, I'm pretty sure it's in the nursery right now. We've got one. It's a Fisher Price nativity set. And it had the, sh- the shepherds, the angels, the wise men, had like baby Jesus, Mary Joseph, had like all Fisher Price Jesus things. And, um, and it had the nativity set itself had a star that came with it. And what's funny is the kids, they always fought over who got to hold and keep, like to the point where they'd like, they hide it in their rooms. They'd take Jesus and run away with him, okay? And so like they'd always fight over Jesus. And it, it, made, it made me laugh because they never fought over the star. They never fought over the shepherds. They never fought over the wise men. They always fought over Jesus. And that's a really important lesson. The star is not that important. What's important at the nativity is Jesus. And so the star is there. We don't know a lot about it, but they, they seek after him. And so today as we, as we look at this story and realize these wise men, they saw a hint, a message, an idea that something significant is going on. And they traverse deserts. They traverse nations. They, who knows exactly how far they want, but, but based on where they were, they would have had to go across literally a desert to seek out Jesus and discover him. And so today, our response to Jesus ought to be, let's seek after him. Let's try to discover. We want to know more. We want to learn more. And as we begin to see the greatness of Jesus, as you see there, we find ourselves longing for more, wanting more. If you see Jesus in his greatness, you'll want to dig in and discover more, just like these wise men. Now, you may not have seen a star. I'm sure they're you know, walking out and there's a star in the sky tonight. But chances are, something has happened in your life that has pinged your interest in Jesus and God. Like there's been some situation, circumstance, upbringing that has been kind of your moment that has shined a spotlight on Jesus and your need for him. Maybe it was a struggle you've gone through, a hardship that's caused you to wonder, is there more? Is there help? There's, there's got to be something different. So like you've gone through this hardship and this struggle that's just made you long for something greater and that answer is Jesus. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a guilt maybe that you're, you've done, you made some mistakes, you've struggled in the past, you've done some things that you're just, you're weighing this, you have this heavy burden that you carry with you because of your past and your choices and you're just wondering what will take away that heaviness and that leads you to Jesus who can forgive our sins where there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Maybe you've heard the message of Jesus and you've heard the gospel and you've come to church and you realize that this is amazing. It's not about me, it's about him. And you respond. Maybe your neighbor or your family member has shared their testimony and it's pinged an interest in Jesus because you see how God has shaped their life. Maybe a coworker has, has had this joy that is unexplainable and frustrating because when the whole world is on fire, they, they have this happiness that you can't put your fingers on. So all around us, there are probably situations that point toward Jesus. And God puts these circumstances in our lives to point us toward Jesus. The question is, will you respond by seeking after him, looking to discover more about him, understand him? The first thing we need to do as we respond to Jesus is to seek after him as we see the wise men do. Now, not all this passage is joyful, right? The next part, actually, we see some negative ways people respond to Jesus. And so the second point we see here is that we need to face our fears about Jesus. Not only do we need to seek after Jesus, but the reality is, As you seek a relationship with Jesus, as you seek to respond to Jesus and make Jesus a part of your life, there are fears that can come concerning Jesus Christ. Look at here in in Matthew chapter chapter, uh, 2. It says this. It says, verse 3, When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When King Herod heard the news about this Jesus... He was deeply disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. See, remember what the wise men said. When the wise men traveled from afar and they came, to, they came to Jerusalem, they went to King Herod, the ruler, the king, the boss, the guy who was in charge, and they said to him, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? I don't know if these wise guys were not all that wise, but like, that's not wise, can you imagine if somebody came to your office and you're like, let's say you're the sales manager, and they come in and they go, 
um, hey, we're looking for the new, they come to you like, hey, we're looking for the new sales manager. Have you seen him? Like, I'm the sales manager and I'm not new. Or if you're like the starting soccer player for your team and, and somebody, somebody comes to soccer practice going, hey, I'm looking for the starting forward. I'm the starting forward. Or you get the idea, right? Like, that's my job. Like, there's going to be a sense of like, hey, who is this person? And so when these, and we know from the history, we know from history, Herod was super paranoid. Like, he saw conspiracies and treason and betrayal everywhere and acted accordingly, okay? This is, this is some twisted stuff he did. So they, they picked the wrong guy to drop this line on, where's the king? So Herod immediately goes into panic mode. He immediately goes into trouble mode. And it says actually that he was disturbed. The word for disturbed is too lightweight. It was, he was deeply terrified. He was shaking with fear. That's, that's the sort, he wasn't just bothered. He was freaking out, disturbed, like causing trouble, throwing furniture over, kind of disturbed. He was terrified, trembling. And it says that all of Jerusalem was that way too. The whole city was that way. Kind of like, you ever heard the expression, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy? If, if King Herod ain't happy, nobody's happy. If the king isn't happy, nobody's happy. And the interesting thing is, as all of Jerusalem is disturbed by Jesus, that's actually a foreshadow. Uh, it, it actually looks forward to later on in the, in the gospel when not only would Jerusalem be disturbed by Jesus, but ultimately they would reject Jesus. When Jesus stood before Pilate, the next ruler, and he said, hey, do you want me to free Barabbas, the murderer, or this Jesus guy? They screamed, crucify him to Jesus. And so this, this disturbance in Jerusalem pointed forward to the ultimate rejection of Jesus by the, by the Jewish people there. And the truth is this, as we apply this to our lives, I, I think we need to be honest about Jesus and realize that, that there are often a lot of fears that people have about committing their lives to Jesus Christ. Like, it's not just as simple as, oh, I'll walk the aisle, I'll say the prayer, uh, happy, happy, right? Sometimes there are genuine concerns about giving our lives over, surrendering our lives to Jesus Christ, trusting in him for our salvation, taking ourselves off the throne and giving us over to him. Like, there are real fears, there are real disturbances that many of us need to face to respond rightly to Jesus Christ. I mean, think about it this way. Jesus is the king. Part of following Jesus is making him Lord of our lives, leader of our lives. We, we follow him, not ourselves. And the truth is, you and I like being the king. We like pretending to be in charge. We like thinking that our lives are in our hands and our lives are our choices. And, and coming to Jesus Christ realizes that we're not the king. He's the king. And there's, there's sometimes some fear. It's hard to let go. You know, Jesus' claim to be king can be disturbing to those of us who like to be king of our own lives. There might be fears over the change that Jesus can bring. <clears throat> that we look, at, we look at what Jesus desires in his word and go, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I want to be that. Like, I don't know if I like that life. There's fears there that we have to face. I remember um, I, met, I met a family several years ago that got saved radically on 9-11, actually. They got saved radically. And I mean, went from like really far away from Christ to like full in for Jesus. And their family were like, who abducted you? Like, what aliens brought you up to their spaceship, put somebody new? Like, this is weird because you're not the person you were yesterday. And that's what Jesus does, right? He transforms our lives. We are not the person. But the truth is there is a weightiness to following Jesus, Matthew chapter, or sorry, Luke chapter 9, verse 23 makes this so clear. Jesus said this. He said to all of them, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. As you respond to Jesus, we've got to deal with those fears. We don't want to deal with Herod, stuff him away, figure it out, eliminate the threat. But we want to take those fears to a loving and gracious and good God and say, God, here are my struggles. Here are my fears. Here's what's disturbing me. Help me in my unbelief. To respond to Jesus, we seek after him and we bring our fears to him. The third thing we see is that we need to challenge indifference toward Jesus. The third thing we see here is that we need to, the, 
There is inside of us a temptation to shrug off Jesus or make him just this little kind of like no big deal part of our lives. This indifference toward Jesus. And you see that here. See, Herod has a plan. Herod's not facing his fears. He's going to go kill the king. That's his goal is to eliminate the threat. And so here, here let, let's read through the next couple of verses. Verse four, here's his plan. So Herod, he, he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people, and he asked them where the Christ would be born. And they tell him, in Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the child, and when you find him, report back to me so I can go and worship him too. Now, Herod's idea of worship and the wise men's idea of worship, two very different definitions of worship. But Herod had a plan. He wanted to eliminate the threat, but he needed to know when, and he needed to know where. And so he summons the Jewish leadership, and he asks them, and all the Jewish leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, they tell them exactly what he needs to know. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says that Bethlehem will be the city where the Savior is born. But you know the problem in this passage? The weird thing about this passage is you don't read about any of those Jewish scholars You don't read about any of those Jewish leaders. You don't read about any of those scribes or Pharisees even remotely interested in saying, huh, maybe we should go check this out. Somebody has claimed to be the Messiah six miles away from Jerusalem in Bethlehem. Maybe we should go for an afternoon stroll and just see what it's all about. Not one of those leaders you see in this passage even remotely interested in going along with the wise men. I mean, I don't want to overly read into this passage, but you don't even see a hint of interest in Jesus. And here's the scary thing. These these Pharisees and scribes, which we know later on from the gospel, we see this over and over again. They knew about the Bible. They knew about God. They knew about God's word, but they they didn't have a heart for God or his word. And that's got to be a reminder to you and I, right? There's a danger in knowing about God, but not having a heart for God. There's a danger for knowing about God, but not pursuing him with our lives. And this is, probably the, this is probably one of the biggest areas of difficulty that we face in our modern world right here, in Hartford County particularly. We have a lot of people, let me just give you some fun statistics. Over 60% of Hartford County around our community has some sort of Christian church background. 60% of the people have some sort of Christianity identified to their past. But only about 8% of people are actively involved in anything Christian with church or discipleship or whatnot. You know what that means? Literally 50% of our county has heard about Jesus and deemed the gospel insignificant for their lives. Shoulder shrug. I don't need to get up off my chair. I don't need to respond to this. Like that, there is such a danger that we know the gospel and it just sits on top of our hard hearts and we become indifferent to it, not even interested in pursuing and so don't let this holiday be, the, be another holiday where you come to Christmas and celebrate Jesus in the moment, but then forget him the rest of your life. These Pharisees and scribes convict us. There is such a strong temptation to know about Jesus, but not live for him, love him, serve him, worship him, pursue him. And so we have to push back against that and seek after Jesus. Let's challenge those indifferences. And I hope that we find ourselves more like the wise men and less like those scribes and Pharisees seeking after Jesus. Now, here's the fourth point as we land this thing. We need to give our worship to Jesus. We, after two negative examples, we go back to the positive, okay? So I figure we'll start positive, go to the negative, and come back. This is how we should be. I want you to just soak in how the wise men worship Jesus in this moment. Verse 9, it says, After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at its rising, and it led them to the, and it, until it came and stopped above the place where this child was. The star appears to be moving, and they follow it. And when they saw the star, 
they were overwhelmed with joy. Just listen to the worship language. Unspeakable joy we sing about. Overwhelmed with joy. And entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling on their knees, they worshiped him. They see the house where Jesus was born, and joy just fills their hearts. The end of their journey. And for many of you, Jesus is the end of the journey. When you meet Jesus, there's this overwhelming rush of joy. I've been longing for this my whole life. And when they see Jesus, they fall on their knees and they worship him. And what I love about this is Jesus had done no speeches yet. Jesus had done no miracles yet. Jesus hadn't raised anybody from the dead. He hadn't taught with authority. Jesus is literally just a young, maybe one-year-old, 18-month-old child. He's done nothing yet. But in their faith, They see him and they go, this is the Savior. And they worship him. And they give him gifts. And all this is predicted. I I wish I had time to go on this, but but Isaiah chapter 60 and 60 actually walks through this. It says, nations will come to your light and the kings to your shining brightness. Or later on in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6, it says, caravans of camels will cover your land, young camels of Median and Ephah, all of those will come from Sheba. They will carry gold and frankincense and proclaim the praises of the Lord. And so even like hundreds of years before Jesus, this is a prophesied moment. And they worship him by giving to him. They worship him by celebrating him. They worship him as a gift. They give him gold. They give him frankincense. They give him myrrh. All things that kind of symbolize his kingship, his priestly nature, even myrrh. Myrrh was a weird gift for a newborn because it's a... It was a spice used for burial. And, uh, you know, gold symbolizes kingship. Frankincense is like a priestly element they used. But then myrrh was a spice they would often use to bury the dead. And that reminds us that Jesus came not just to be king and live as king, but he came to die as king for you and for me. And so when we come to Jesus, we can't just celebrate Jesus like any other holiday. You know, we celebrate flags on Flag Day and veterans on Veterans Day and turkeys on Thanksgiving, I guess, or food or whatever it is. Like, we, we celebrate things on holidays, but Jesus just can't be a holiday we celebrate. Jesus is, we don't, we don't worship flags, we don't worship veterans, we don't worship turkeys, um, but Jesus demands not just our celebration, but our worship. He demands not just our, our nice holiday vibes, but he demands our full and total surrender, our gifts, our lives, we respond with worship to him. And so those four, those four responses shape how we should be moved by Jesus. It's not a shoulder shrug on the, on the couch. It's a jump up and active and do something. We seek him, we face our fears, we challenge indifference, and we worship him. And so I hope that you know Jesus this morning who lived that perfect and sinless life, died on the cross for your sins and for my sins, was buried, and on the third day rose again. That's the joyful news of Christmas, is that we have a Savior who's died for us. And if we need to respond to him, if you've never made a decision to follow after him, the Bible tells us that we, we admit in many ways that we have fallen short of God's plan. We, we repent from our sins. We believe in Jesus Christ. And we choose to follow after him and trust in him. We have faith in him. And if that's a decision you want to make and we want more to understand about, I want to encourage you to come, come talk to me after, put it on your connecting card, drop it off the bucket. We'll follow up with you. But we want to help make sure that you can respond fully and totally to the good news of Jesus Christ. So let's pray together.